<laughs> Very good. Um, I want, to, uh, I want to pick up just uh, three or four things, one of them reasonably large. First one is this. Uh, you've, you've heard a repeated mantra through the place, I hope, through this last uh, couple of days, as everyone has been speaking about these things. And, uh, and, and so Murray Capel wonderfully brought us to the being uh, bathed in the word. Derek talked about it too. Uh, it, it just, just a little thing I remember being told years ago that the older pastor in the previous generation would go everywhere with his Bible. And this was 30 years ago, someone said, but the modern pastor 30 years ago goes everywhere with his diary. And that always struck me. What does the 2021 pastor go everywhere with? IPad. Their phone, their iPad. Um, now, there is something about carrying the Bible. Can I encourage... You don't have to do this, but I'm going to... What's the non-manipulation way of doing this, Trev? <laughs> I'm going to advocate... That, that you burn all your pew Bibles. Well, no, 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 no. Give, send them away overseas somewhere, <laughs> right? Um, get rid of your pew Bibles because uh, one, of the, one of the hindrances to a Bible culture is that people just turn up to church and maybe pull out the Bible in the pew and put it back and go home. Think of the power that happens when the husband, the man, the father of the family rounds up the kids, grabs his Bible, gets in the car and drives with his Bible to church. To create that culture, which is what we've been working on for 25 years, actually is another tactile cultural experience that flavours and shapes things. These little things uh, are massive. Can I mention mission? There's a... Um, is this slide able to come up? Uh, oh, very good. Remember we talked about the ecosystem? Someone asked me about this very helpfully, that all the arrows are going in. Uh, is that intentional? Yes. There's, there's things that we do to make the community of God's people grow, that go into it. But a drawing that we've, not, we've used in previous years, but not this time because of the focus we're on, is that as that momentum of heat grows within the church, it causes people then to spin out of the church into their community life to love and serve the world around them, to then bring people back in. So just the, the, all of that is for the purpose that the, the spiral wouldn't be further in, but further, just a greater heat, to then push people back out again. Go in love to serve is a, is a final kind of affirmation. Another thing um, I want to mention is the importance of taking responsibility. So it's been raised a number of times. It's one of the things that, I, if you can remember anything that's happened, but I did raise the question around the need to take responsibility and build responsibility and uh, use some of the language of inputs and outputs and so on. And there is wisdom in noting that that is a very mechanistic way of using language. And I acknowledge that. And I just want to affirm that be careful not to bring an engineering culture to this. And that language... Um, uh, it's, it's wise to push back against that language. For me, it's just a way of um, making shorthand. But language does create culture and we need to appreciate that. Things that we do to make a difference to the outcomes. It's that language we perhaps need to apply. Um, but I do want to make a case that one of the ruts that we are in is that we don't care enough about outcomes we are faithful, rarely fruitful focused people as a culture and I want to push it further than some of you are comfortable with but I do want this not to be lost in the disputes and debates around God's sovereignty, human responsibility. That's the place we're in at the moment, God's sovereignty, human responsibility. The thing I don't, would deeply concern that we don't lose is that we do in some measure need to take responsibility for the fruit of our work in some measure. Um, ministry is not finally about me and my activities, it's about Jesus. It's his glory and his mission, yes. We, we should not be thinking, are my activities praiseworthy so that I can feel satisfied about myself? No, that's right. We shouldn't be thinking like that. 
But it is Jesus' mission being achieved and we are called to take part in that by doing activities that will produce an effect. We have outcomes to pursue because that's our commission, to make disciples, not to merely present the gospel in the hope that maybe, but to make disciples, it's very active language. Paul talks about that I might save some. He's bold enough to use that language, that I might save some. Not that I might make possible that God may, he uses the language that's very active. Um, now, this is about love, it's not concentrating on me and my activities but whether these activities are seeing gospel transformation happen in the lives of people we are working with. Um, to not think about outcomes is to not care about the congregation and the lost. It's to be me-centred and have a lack of love. Now, all of that won't trigger the whole thinking about my responsibility, God's sovereignty. It just pushes us to think outcomes, it us to care about those things. But I do want to push us further. Now, you might disagree at this point, but please don't lose that other. I do think we need to wrestle harder with uh, how we can think about our responsibilities for outcomes. It's interesting to me that 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where God is the one who gives the growth, that in that very chapter, the judgment that is, is brought upon people is what they produce. Their work will be destroyed. You see, it's the outcomes of their work that are part of the measure that God brings. There is something there to consider. Um, the building itself will be judged the fruit of their work. Now, we don't control the fruit, we don't control the outcomes. God is sovereign. But we do influence them. We do impact them and I see many of, me, of us, me, you, us together, doing things that are dumb and we are failing to be self-critical enough and producing poor outcomes and it's our responsibility to take care of that, no one else's. Um, now, how do you make change as you go away from this time? We've got, we're going to get the panel up in a moment. How do we make change? Can I talk to you about a quick process of change management? Are you ready for this one? As you go through all of this, if you're going to go back to churches and make change, it takes time and emotional energy. You can't do a change management process through church in the midst of all the business of life. You need to carve out a chunk of time, get away from your office, get away from your study, get away from your church, go somewhere and carve out two days to think, dream, plan, scheme. You need to find, you need to be proactively building the time into your calendar to get away. Take your team away, bring your key leaders away, get yourself some time. Time is critical, emotional energy is critical. Think of it as a three-year process. Big change is a three-year process. The way we would often consider it uh, in sort of Reach Australia material that we work with is the first year is building the heat for change. It, it's, it's building the, the energy for people to want to change. Now, you do two things in there. You build a burning platform to help... You, you, you set fire to the platform that people are on so that they can't stay there any longer and want to get off. Where we're at now, you need to build heat to go, we can't stay where we are, we need to change. You need to paint a better desired future. So I push people away from where we are by painting how dreadful it is, burning platform, and give them something far more attractive to jump to. What could be the wonderful future, how it would make a massive difference. You build heat in the first year. Through that time, you get together a team uh, that actually you can start working on more cohesively with it, a cohort for change. Um, and with this group, here's the three keys to leadership in this area. Leaders are direction givers, meaning makers and full of empathy. Three key pieces for leadership. You need to give direction as a leader. Where are we going? What's the change? 
You need to give meaning to that direction, why it's a meaningful thing to pursue, meaning-making, and you need to bring em empathy to the exercise. Change is going to be hard. I get it, we get it, we feel it with you. And that will empower your ability to see change happen. Build this cohort, engage with them, listen to them, adjust with them. As change begins, so first year you build heat, through the second year you're beginning to implement, and through the second year as implementation takes place, celebrate wins. Celebrate small wins so that people see it was meaningful. The price we paid to bring this change about actually is doing, it's working. Third year, build in the change. It takes time to secure change. You can't just make change and walk away. You've got to pay attention to the tail end of the change process to actually make it get secured and you don't drift back into the rut, you see. Now there's some uh, further material. What I want to do is get the panel up and see if we can bounce around on some of this together. Now questions have been coming in and do I need to say amen and step down or something? Is that what happened?